Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is circuit analysis with dependent sources. Our objective is to learn to analyze circuits including dependent voltage and current sources using mesh and or nodal analysis. This lecture operates under the presumption that the viewer has watched the dependent sources lecture and is skilled in either mesh or nodal analysis. If you haven't watched these lectures yet or only dimly recall their contents, by all means, please take the time to do so now. As longtime subscribers of this channel are keenly aware, I have nothing but contempt, scorn, and ridicule for mesh and nodal analysis. These obsolete practices are unnecessarily complicated, of limited use, and have been largely replaced by circuit simulation software. This being said, both mesh and nodal analysis are elegant, cool, and make excellent party tricks when in the company of nerds. Let it never be said that I labeled mesh and nodal analysis ineffective, but rather unnecessary and unimportant when compared to other circuit analysis skills and practical hands-on exposure to instrumentation and equipment. There are special occasions in which mesh or nodal analysis are the perfect fit, but these occasions are so few and so far between, they are not worth the trouble of you dedicating countless hours of your precious life to their study. Case in point, the analysis of circuits incorporating dependent sources. This is the single occasion of an unimaginably infinite number of other more plausible and practical occasions where I will grudgingly admit mesh and nodal analysis are the go-to techniques. In the astronomically rare occasion you are ever presented with this scenario, this is the key that fits the lock. For students enrolled in my particular basic electricity and electronics courses, you will be happy to know that this lecture is optional. If you are one of my students in place of this lecture, I'm asking you to go get yourself a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a dog, or take up a time-consuming hobby. If you've already got one or more of these, go have a baby. There are far more important things to do in life and have far more carryover value than mesh and nodal analysis of dependent sources. If you're still with me, you are extremely bored or more than likely being compelled to learn this technique by your instructor because their instructor made them learn it when they went through school 70 years ago. Let us begin. Consider a multi-source circuit containing a voltage-controlled voltage source, where output voltage is proportional to six times V3, where the controlling voltage signal, V3, is the voltage across resistor R3, is inside the same circuit. This is one of those chicken-or-the-egg type causality quandaries that will have chasing your tail for quite some time. The output of the dependent voltage source is proportional to the voltage signal V3, which is proportional to the output of the dependent voltage source, which is proportional to the voltage signal V3, which is, and so on and on and on. Traditional circuit analysis techniques clearly won't work here, and we need to rummage around in the back of the electronics museum and dust off mesh analysis. Fair warning, I categorically refuse to review algebraic manipulation, matrix math, scientific calculators, and mesh nodal analysis in this particular lecture. If you need to bring yourself up to speed, by all means, check out the previous content available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you're up to the challenge, by all means, try this yourself or follow along and let me show you how it's done. You recall mesh analysis is a four-step procedure. Step one, assign a distinct current for each loop. I prefer each loop current goes clockwise, regardless of the polarity of sources in that loop. By establishing a common direction, this prevents you from second-guessing at aiding and opposing configurations. Let's say loop current IA in yellow goes clockwise. Similarly, let's say IB in orange also goes clockwise. Step two, indicate polarities within each loop defined by the current of that loop. This means elements shared by loops will have two sets of polarity. R1 experiences IA left to right, so its polarity will be positive to negative left to right. R2 experiences IA top to bottom, so inside the A loop, its polarity will be positive to negative top to bottom. In contrast, R2 experiences IB bottom to top, so inside the B loop, its polarity will be positive to negative bottom to top. No R2 is a shared element between two loops, and as such, it has two polarities. Finally, R3 experiences IB left to right, so its polarity will be positive to negative left to right. Step three, perform a Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of each loop in the direction of the loop current. For elements shared by more than one loop, use the polarity as seen by the loop of interest. The polarity voltage sources are unaffected. A voltage rise is defined in a negative and out a positive, and a voltage drop is defined as in a positive and out a negative. For any closed loop, the summation of rises equals the summation of voltage drops, or stated in another manner, the summation of both rises and drops would equal zero. For the loop in yellow, the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation is a rise of six times V3 minus the drop V1 minus the drop V2, which equals zero. 
for the loop in orange, the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation is minus the drop V2, minus the drop V3, and minus the drop across the 80 volt source, which equals zero volts. Finally, step four, group the KVL equations for each loop using the AX plus BY equals C format, and then solve for the unique solutions of the matrix using the reduced row echelon format function of the TI-89. Again, I have absolutely no intention of reviewing algebraic manipulation and matrix manipulation on the scientific calculator in this lecture. If you need to review these techniques, by all means, check out the Mesh Analysis Socks lecture at the Big Bad Tech channel. Key to the analysis of circuits, including dependent sources, is this. In what manner do the loop currents, IA and IB, relate to the voltages V1, V2, V3, and the controlling signal for the voltage-dependent voltage source? You will no doubt recall that voltage is current times resistance. R1 experiences IA only. R2 experiences IA and IB in opposition. R3 experiences IB only. Substituting in the Ohm's Law equivalents for V1, V2, and V3 for both equations, we're left with 6 times R3 times IB minus R1 times IA minus R2 times IA minus IB equals 0 and minus R2 times IB minus IA minus R3 times IB minus 80 equals 0. Substituting in the given values and grouping the first Kirchhoff's voltage law equation in the AX plus BY equals C format results in the expression minus 140 IA plus 320 IB equals 0. Similarly, substituting in the given values and grouping the second Kirchhoff's voltage law equation in the AX plus BY equals C format results in the expression 80 IA minus 120 IB equals 80. This results in the 2 by 3 matrix minus 140, 320, 0, 80 minus 120, 80, where the reduced row echelon format function yields the solution of IA equals 2.9 amps and IB equals 1.6 amps. R1 experiences IA and IA only. I1 therefore equals 2.9 amps left to right. I2 experiences IA top to bottom and IB bottom to top. I2 therefore equals IA minus IB or 1.6 amps top to bottom. Finally, R3 experiences IB and IB only. I3 is therefore equal to 1.3 amps left to right. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V1 equals 174.5 volts positive or negative left to right. Another application of Ohm's law demonstrates V2 equals 130.9 volts positive to negative top to bottom. And finally, another application of Ohm's law demonstrates V3 equals 50.9 volts positive to negative left to right. The output of the voltage controlled voltage source is 6 times V3. Substituting our calculated value for V3 demonstrates the voltage controlled voltage source is producing an output of 305.9 volts. As a means of checking our work, consider the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for the loop on the left. The 305.9 volt rise does indeed equal the summation of the 174.5 and 130.9 volt drops. Similarly, consider the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for the loop on the right. The 130.9 volt rise does indeed equal the summation of the 50.9 and 80 volt drops when traveled in the clockwise direction. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence. Our answers are correct. Again, take a moment to reflect upon how we achieve these results. Mesh analysis, algebraic manipulation, and matrix math aside, the key point in this lecture is this. Use Ohm's law to define the controlling signal for the dependent voltage source, in this case V3, as some function of one of the unknown variables, in this case one of the loop currents, or V3 equals R3 times IB. From there, it's up to you to algebraically manipulate and make sense of the resulting matrix. As a point of general advice, I have a tendency to prefer mesh analysis for circuits incorporating dependent voltage sources, since mesh analysis uses Kirchhoff's voltage law to solve for unknown currents. This isn't always the case, and you might run across circuits making use of dependent current sources. As such, let's try another illustrated example, this time featuring a current controlled dependent current source with an output proportional to 1 fifth times I3, where I3 is the current through R3 inside the same circuit. It's by no means an impossible task to tackle this circuit using mesh analysis with or without a source conversion. However, nodal analysis might yield easier results. You'll recall nodal analysis is a four-step procedure. Step one, determine the number of relevant nodes in this circuit where current has a choice of paths. Let's use node A in yellow, node B in orange, and the bottom node in green. Step two, 
From these relevant nodes, assign a reference node from which all other relevant nodes will be measured. Let's use the bottom green node as our reference. Step 3. Perform a Kirchhoff's current law analysis for each of the remaining nodes. If we assume I1 to enter node A and I2 and I3 to leave node A, the Kirchhoff's current law equation for node A is I1 equals I2 plus I3. Similarly, if we assume I3 to enter node B and I4 and the current controlled current source to leave node B, the Kirchhoff's current law equation for node B is I3 equals I4 plus one-fifth of I3. Step 4. Finally, group the Kirchhoff's current law equations for each node using the AX plus BY equals C format and solve for the unique solutions using the reduced rho echelon format function on the scientific calculator. One can then use these nodal voltages to solve for remaining circuit properties like voltage, current, and power. Again, I have absolutely no intention of reviewing algebraic manipulation and matrix manipulation on the scientific calculator in this lecture. If you need to review these techniques, by all means, check out the Nodal Analysis Sucks lecture at the Big Bad Tech channel. As previously, the key to the analysis of circuits including dependent sources is this. In what manner do the nodal voltages VA and VB relate to the currents I1, I2, I3, I4, and the controlling signal for the current control dependent current source? You will no doubt recall that current is voltage over resistance. R1 experiences a differential of E minus VA, where I1 equals E minus VA over R1. R2 experiences a differential of VA, where I2 equals VA over R2. R3 experiences a differential of VA minus VB, where I3 equals VA minus VB over R3. Finally, R4 experiences a differential of VB, where I4 is equal to VB over R4. Substituting in the Ohm's Law equivalents for I1, I2, I3, and I4 for both equations, we're left with E minus VA over R1 equals VA over R2 plus VA minus VB over R3 for the first equation, and VA minus VB over R3 equals VB over R4 plus one-fifth VA minus VB over R3 for the second equation. We now need to group these two Kirchhoff's current law equations in the AX plus BY equals C format where the unknown variable x is VA and the unknown variable y is VB. Substituting in the given values and grouping the first Kirchhoff's current law equation in the AX plus BY equals C format results in the expression minus 0.123 times VA plus 0.04 times VB equals minus 0.3. Similarly, substituting in the given values and grouping the second Kirchhoff's current law equation in the AX plus BY equals C format results in the expression 0 0.032 times VA minus 0.52 times VB, which equals zero. This results in the two by three matrix minus 0.123, 0 0.04, minus 0.3, 0 0.032, minus 0 0.520, which the reduced row echelon format function yields a solution of VA equals three volts and VB equals 1.9 volts. Let's use these nodal voltages to solve for other electrical properties in the same system. R1 experiences a differential of E minus VA. Substituting our given values demonstrates V1 equals 6 volts. R2 experiences a differential of 3 volts. R3 experiences a differential of VA minus VB. Substituting our given values demonstrates V3 is 1.2 volts. Finally, V4 experiences a differential of 1.9 volts. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates I1 is 198.7 milliampers. Another application of Ohm's law demonstrates I2 is 151.9 milliampers. Another application of Ohm's law demonstrates that I3 is 46.8 milliampers. And finally, another application of Ohm's law demonstrates that I4 is 37.4 milliampers. Finally, the output of the current controlled current source is one fifth of I3. Substituting our calculated values for I3 demonstrates the current controlled current source is producing 9.4 milliampers. As a means of checking our work, consider the Kirchhoff's current law equation for node A. The incoming 198.7 milliampers does indeed equal the summation of the outgoing 151.9 and 46.8 milliampers. Similarly, consider the Kirchhoff's current law equation for node B. The incoming 46.8 milliampers of current does indeed equal the summation of the outgoing 37.4 and 9.4 milliampers. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence our answers are correct. All right, I don't want to spend too much more time on this topic for two very important reasons. One, I absolutely detest this topic. Two, you will never, ever, ever, ever make use of these techniques in the field. 
The only reason I published this lecture is out of sheer pity for students enrolled in basic electricity and electronics classes whose instructors are forcing them to use these outdated techniques. For those that take offense to this, too bad. You're wrong. There are far more relevant and applicable things an aspiring technician should be studying. However, in the very, very rare occasion you're ever presented with a dependent source inside a multi-source system, at least now you'll have some idea how mesh and or nodal analysis can be used to solve for electrical properties. Before we bring this lecture to a close, let me remind you that these techniques are not limited to DC circuits and DC dependent sources. You want to do this for an AC system and AC dependent sources? Here's the deal. Just go back and put a sinusoidal sign on the schematic symbol, use complex impedances, and use phasers. Seriously, that is it. I'm not going to make another giant lecture to lead you by the nose through yet another briar patch you shouldn't be wandering around in the first place. In conclusion, we learned to analyze circuits including dependent sources using mesh and nodal analysis. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.